the special edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report, a very special report. Our very special guest is a, well, I would say he's an insider's insider. If you've been following our series about Benghazi, this individual has provided the majority, if not, well, if not almost all of the information about Benghazi that's turned out to be 100% accurate for purposes of his position and uh, uh, other matters, we cannot disclose him by name. I'll just call him the professor. How's that sound? With that, let's bring the professor on. The, the issue, by the way, folks, is this past week we heard um, about uh, about a particular matter about uh, the Dias Air Force Base, and uh, there were some some rumors, and then uh, later confirmation that nuclear. Uh, rogue nuclear warheads were were taken without paperwork, allegedly, ostensibly from the Dias Air Force Base to, ostensibly, to South Carolina, uh, for either for uh, uh, their their uh, position there or to be taken elsewhere. This this story was initially broken on September third by Anthony uh, Giarducci as well as Alex Jones of Infowars. They went public with the exclusive report. Followed by that, or follow, following that, Senator Lindsey Graham had mentioned about the possibility of a nuclear, uh, rogue nuclear attack in South Carolina. Rather interesting, rather coincidental. With that, I'll bring on our very special guest, uh, sir. Welcome to the broadcast. What do you know about this? Well, uh, you know, it's 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 disconcerting. It's very. Um, troubling to anybody that actually understands how things are handled in this particular realm. Uh, when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, that is an area where uh, they don't get touched, they don't get moved, uh, you don't get contact with them uh, unless you have been vetted uh, you know, to a very high level. Uh, the average, just a guard, has been cleared. They know who his grandmother dated. Um, it's it's not something that classically we have taken lightly at all, and for good reason. Uh, we have checks, counter checks, um, and verifications that occur before a person even gets close to a building that has. Uh, these components in them. And so when we hear that uh, there have been incidents, uh, you know, although this is the one that is in the news right now, over the last decade or so, there have been a number of incidents involving uh, nuclear weapons and their handling that have been, you know, very disconcerting. And uh, any of the uh, military personnel in your audience who have actually been in a facility that has these uh, devices or transits them occasionally knows what I'm talking about. There is just a, a whole other level beyond normal base security that occurs around these weapons and the personnel that uh, have contact with them. When we look at this specific incident, if the reports are accurate, then, uh, you know, I think we have to really take a deep breath and and pay attention because something um, seriously wrong is occurring here. Well, the, the initial reports were uh, the, uh, uh, the base commander was – didn't follow orders apparently, according to the source, uh, according to Infowars source, the Dias Air Force base commander authorized unknown parties to transfer the nuclear warheads, absent of any necessary presidential authorizations or directives that always that must always accompany such a transfer. Is that true? I mean, does the president have to sign off on these? Well. Uh the president uh, has to give direct authorization. Uh, even in a time of war, uh, there are uh, procedural 
um, things uh, that have to be done so that no one person or even a group of people short of the right authorizations can um, authorize the uh, handling movement, um, even just servicing. You can't pick them up on a pallet and move them across the room unless uh, the president has personally signed off, and that's not a delegation order. Even even in a time of war, uh, you know, there's certain procedural things that have to occur, and when uh, if the reports are accurate, then you know, I don't believe that the president signed off on anything in this particular incident, but maybe he did. You know, I don't, I just, my gut doesn't tell me that that's what happened or that somebody would have shown up with orders that were properly, um, uh, uh, processed with the proper signatures or the proper authorization codes, etc. But in this particular incident, um, as, as I understand it, and I don't have direct knowledge of this specific incident, but it sounds like what we were dealing with here was mothballed uh, nuclear weapons that were not currently um, in a uh, state of readiness to go into any of the uh, transit systems or delivery systems that we currently are using. And that's important in this story because uh, if we were, for example, if somebody was just trying to resupply a ship or a submarine or an aircraft for possible use to do some type of nuclear uh, deterrent or uh, nuclear strike, then it would have to be a weapon that was uh, currently, um, uh, you know, ready to go, if you will. And these were not uh, weapons that were in that state of readiness. This was uh, mothballed stuff that was sitting idle. And so kind of an out of sight, out of mind, very few people knew about it. They weren't in the regular inventory list. uh, weren't even inventoried as uh, stuff that would be uh, handled or processed or uh, guarded in in the same way as stuff that's in the active arsenal. And so, you know, you kind of go, somebody was sneaking around, hoping that nobody was looking, and then on uh, a wink and a nod, um, going to pass it through. And my gut instinct is, and again, I don't know this specific incident, so you asked me about it, and, and so I'm just giving you my, my uh, gut response. And I have had a few conversations with others that, uh, uh, you know, are in these realms that, that deal with these things uh, you know, currently. And uh, there, there is just something here that does not ring uh, correctly. If uh, if the thought was nobody's paying attention and then proper procedures aren't being followed, um, you know, you worry that, uh, you know, what was the point here? What was the purpose here? Um, this incident that, that comes to mind instantly in my mind that is the cross-reference to this and that that I think is the one that we should be concerned about is the incident that happened with the uh, Russians um, uh, that probably did more to change the world that we live in today than any other incident since World War II. And most Americans have no clue about that incident. It's been discussed, even the people that have kind of outed aspects of it, uh, I don't think even grasp the full magnitude of what one day in 1968, March 8th, 1968, what impact that one day has had on their entire life. But everything that you know about the world you're in today, everything that you're experiencing in your world today is a product of 
a few hours, a few moments that came to a head out in the Pacific, north of Hawaii, uh, March 8th, 1968. And you and I discussed that previously, Doug. Yes, yes, we have. And, and folks, you've got to listen to this because I, when I first heard this, I, I, I was in disbelief and I had to do research on my own and, and the, the information is cloudy at best, but I can tell you with, uh, with a high level of certainty based on the information I've gotten from our very special guest that uh, he knows the inside story and what you're about to hear, folks. It relates not only relates to today, but is incredible. I mean, it's just incredible. What happened on March eighth, nineteen sixty eight, that changed the world, or could have changed the world, or produced the world in which we live right now? Well, let me just give you a brief context. Of course, uh, we were um, in a very uh, active moment in Vietnam, and uh, so we had, uh, you know, men in arms. Uh, In Asia, we were doing uh, covert activities in countries around Vietnam, not uh, a lot, Uh, more of that happened shortly thereafter, but uh, Tet Offensive... uh, was occurring uh, in the same time period. Um, We were uh, at loggerheads with uh, China, and, uh, of course, we had uh, problems with Russia. Russia and China had been um, actually working together in the early 60s, and then by the the mid-60s and late 60s had started to uh, um, uh, be butting heads and, and... were in a real competition. And, you know, the, the classic line in that era was that um, the United States and Russia were going to beat each other's heads in, and then after we'd weakened each other to a point where, you know, neither of us could do anything to further, China stepped into the vacuum unscathed. Hmm. And... So that was kind of the mentality that was going on in that time. And, of course, some of your listeners would be able to add a lot more depth. I'm just glossing it over in in the most superficial way. But uh, in that era, just uh, a few years earlier, in in the early 60s, when Russia and China were seeing eye-to-eye a bit, Russia sold China to Gulf One, uh, GOLF uh, One uh, submarines with nuclear capability. Russia had gone on and developed the Gulf II, which had uh, uh, carried missiles that had greater range. Uh, the Gulf ones had a range of under 400 miles, and the Gulf IIs had a range of a little over 800 miles, as I recall. And uh, because Russia and China were beating each other's heads in, it would look like we might be able to just uh, step back a little bit and let them take each other out. We'd, we'd be able to survive that. And the incident that occurred is that, uh, and a lot of the details, you know, people can get into all the minutia. Uh, for the sake of brevity for the show, I'm just going to gloss over it, but uh, there's plenty of places that people can go to, to get more information. Um, a rogue operation uh, was conducted inside of Russia where a group of men who had knowledge of how the uh, nuclear submarines operated but weren't sailors that were known by other sailors in the submarine community were placed on a nuclear sub that was K-129 that was supposed to be in for uh, a normal service and, and a rest period, and put out to sea under very unusual circumstances with uh, a larger crew than they would normally ever have. Uh, there was all sorts of um, bizarre aspects to this that we know even from uh, Russian defectors and, and insiders since then and from information that was developed as a process of, a part of the process that uh, I'm describing to you. That submarine took off 
sailed south and went, uh, of course, the detection capabilities, the ability to monitor submarines was far less than it is today. We had the SOSA network, which is a, um, a surveillance network in the ocean listening for ships going by and identifying, you know, signatures, sound signatures, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, um, we lost the submarine, uh, you know, had it tracked for quite a while and, and knew approximately where it was going for its, its uh, work. But it was obviously unusual. We knew it was unusual. And that submarine uh, disappeared. Uh, right. Initial reports were, okay, uh, and, and this was in the New York, uh, I believe the New York Times and others, initial reports were uh, it could have been a flash discharge uh, uh, through saltwater flooding in the diesel uh, diesel uh, uh, part of the uh, submarine. Another report was um, it suffered a collision uh, with yet another submarine, specifically the Skate class USS Swordfish. Um, but then there's a third, more uh, what I would consider, based on evidence, uh, a third, perhaps more likely possibility. Well, the the Russians believed that the submarine um, had a collision with uh, with uh, the uh, I apologize, I've got something going there to go. Um, the uh, Soviets believed that the Russian uh, sub had been sunk or collided with. Uh, the American uh, sub swordfish, and so uh, as a result of that, uh, another incident took place in the Atlantic, where uh, the uh, uh, Thrasher was sunk, and uh, a lot of people believe that that was Soviet retaliation because they believed that we had sunk their sub. Uh, whatever the belief was at that moment isn't uh, completely relevant because what subsequently happened, radiation was detected um, in an area north of Hawaii by a, a, a oceanographic crew. Uh, that was traced back to a location north of Hawaii and then uh, uh, a submarine uh known as the Halibut, uh, was specially outfitted to go to the location where this was at, where there had been some wreckage detected, and uh, um, ascertained that it was, in fact, the Soviet submarine. And the most important thing is in the course of, of examining the submarine photographically, it was obvious that the submarine had uh, exploded in the missile tube area uh, during the course of a launch. Uh, part of the reason we knew there was a launch was because of the condition of one of the crew members who would have been stationed outside the boat for launch purposes on that kind of a sub. What was most important for our current conversation in all of this is that that Russian sub was simulating, it was a Gulf II submarine, it was simulating the actions of a Gulf I submarine. It went down to the range that a Gulf One submarine would have to go to to fire its missiles, its missile to hit Pearl Harbor. And so what we say about that and what history has said about that uh, in the black ops world is that the Russians or some faction within Russia or some group that had captured or controlled some segment of uh, the military in Russia had tried to conduct a false flag that would be interpreted as a action by China against the U.S., a second Pearl Harbor, if you will. Unbelievable. And we would then have to retaliate. We would have, have made some assumptions those assumptions would be, couldn't have been the Russians because they can shoot from 800 miles out. There's no reason for them to come down to 350 out. The triangulation that occurred, remember, we didn't have GPS then. We didn't have all the satellites then. We didn't have, uh, you know, things in the, in the missiles. Um, they weren't uh, 
as complex, as, as smart as the missiles are today. So what you had to do in those days, you had to uh, get on the surface, triangulate between um, radio signals that were broadcast signals from different locations, and then you would triangulate your position. Know that you were at a very precise location related to those signals, launch your missile going on a certain trajectory, knowing it's flight time and, and uh, that it would land within a certain zone, um, you know, where you're trying to send it. They weren't nearly as accurate as they are today. And so uh, the process to get a submarine in position to fire a missile and have it hit the right place well, was pretty complex. And it was pretty easy to make it look like somebody else, in this case, the Chinese. So with a false flag attack, had this worked, a rogue element inside of Russia could have caused the United States and China to go to war, probably nuclear war, some kind of a nuclear exchange some kind of, of a severe action on our part, at the very least, us ramping up. And you might have lost, you know, half a million, a million people in, in Pearl Harbor, probably made it mostly uninhabitable for a very long period of time in that main area. Uh, it would have been bigger than Nagasaki or Hiroshima. And then uh, what would your world look like today for a lot of your listeners? Um what were you doing? March 8th, 1968, what would your life have been like different from that moment? Wow. Well, had there been a nuclear exchange and then a war and, and what would Vietnam have ended up being? What would that, you know, would that have been World War III then? Um, uh, but what actually happened is that, uh, in fact, at that moment in time, the largest uh, expenditure for a single ship <laughs> that ever happened up to that moment in time was to build a ship called the Glomar Explorer. And uh, a lot of your listeners have heard Glomar Challenger also, a slightly smaller ship um, that did similar uh, subsea mining. And they were close enough that they were somewhat interchangeable and there was a little mischief there so that we could fool the Russians which ship was which and where they were. Uh, the, the cover story was that uh, Hughes was building this ship to mine for magnesium nodules off the ocean of the seafloor bottom where the, these things roll around like little ball bearings you can pick them up and and uh, they're worth a lot of money, and, and so you'd have a big grappling hook and pick it up. So this elaborate cover story was made. And this ship, uh, the complexity of the ship is, you know, staggering. I mean, um, it sounds like I watched the ship and it had a hook and it went down and did whatever. The expenditure that we underwent to build this ship was the largest expenditure for any single vessel. Uh, it cost all by itself, according to reports, uh, to build about the same as it would have to build a carrier and a couple of the ships that accompanied the carrier at the time. And, yeah, and, and, and that's amazing by itself because when you think about it, you're you're putting. I think at the time it was five and a half million dollars to build the Glomar, to to, to for for what purpose? To bring up a submarine uh, that had uh, archaic or allegedly archaic uh, um, uh, 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 equipment, uh, electronics, and such. So it really wouldn't make a lot of sense to invest that much money to just to bring up that submarine. Well, no, it wasn't five and a half million. It was in the billions. This was oh. a billion with a billion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. The 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 hook probably cost uh the hook that was used to pick things up probably cost uh real money uh several hundred million dollars by the time the engineering and the and the assembly and everything else. It the was you know, and then, Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. And, and so, you know, you just have to say, well, I didn't know about it. You know, I didn't know that they were putting that kind of money. No, you wouldn't have known about it. And it, and then even when stuff leaked out, 
the cover story was to cover what it was doing. And so here's this huge expenditure. And even when they went out and, and grabbed the submarine, there was a cover story about that they dropped half of it and didn't get all of it. Um, for anybody that thinks I'm talking out of school here, I'll just tell you, first of all, they did get all of it. And part of the way that we uh, know now in the public light that they got all of it is because the ship's bell was in a portion of the ship that supposedly broke off and fell back to the seafloor bottom. And so uh, here just a few years back, uh, after Russian demands for information about the crew, um, we gave them the bell. And it was a code way of saying, don't mess with us. We got it all. And, you know, nothing's, there's no fooling around going here. But let's get to the core story as it relates to what happened here at Dias. That recovery operation, in part, was to finish out the rest of the story when we had done extensive uh, photographic work and recovered a uh, number of pieces, including uh, missile uh, pieces, components. Um, and it was used to convince the Chinese that we weren't concocting a story to them. Because remember, China was a closed society. They weren't really open to us in that era. That's true. They were a veil. And because of what we had, because what our emissaries were able to uh, take and show the Chinese, including physical evidence beyond pictures, the Chinese agreed to work with the U.S., not be so cloistered and closed, so there wouldn't be the possibility of a false flag attack, a misunderstanding between us, or mischievous activity that could lead to a conflict that uh, wasn't actually a real conflict between us. And so the Chinese, it was said that Nixon... Only Nixon could go to China. Well, what was the what was the tool that Nixon used to get the Chinese to come out and and engage with us? It was the Glomar Explorer's recovery of K-129. Wow! And the proof that Russia or some rogue element in Russia had uh, commandeered a submarine and tried to cause World War III, cause us to go to war. And so you can say, well, uh, would the uh, people in charge in the Kremlin at the time have wanted to go to war with the U.S.? Uh, no, but they weren't. They were trying to do a covert action. It was inside their intelligence community inside of their KGB that some group had gotten control and pulled off this nefarious action so and just, nearly brought the world to war. The yeah. world to war. Just to make sure I understand this correctly, you've got a rogue nucle uh, Russian nuclear submarine in the Pacific launching a nuclear bomb uh, on, on Pearl Harbor uh, for the purpose of framing China. So we would war with China, but it backfired. The, the missile somehow prematurely detonated or something happened where it, it didn't work, thank God. Well, and there's a couple different stories. What's been said, uh, I know what the the men who did the project that, that explained it to me believed precisely occurred. I'll save that for now. It's not necessarily relevant to this conversation. I don't know that, that it's appropriate to, to discuss that at this time. But for the purposes of our discussion, by whatever mechanism that that missile detonated in the launch tube, intentional, accidental, uh, an unknown um, 
something that made it not possible to launch without uh, some additional um, uh, disarming of a device. Uh, whatever the element was uh, that caused it to detonate, it was still usable because what you have to think about here is whoever put that out there, if it wasn't the main political um, parties in Russia at the time, uh, if it wasn't the leaders of Russia at the time, if it was a rogue element, well, who was in charge of that rogue element? Was it, um, you know, external to the Kremlin or internal? And, uh, you know, in our conversations today, here in the United States, we're talking about is there a globalist elite who is somehow trying to um, push us in directions that suit their purposes for creating a global new world order? Um, and uh, are we essentially a captured operation today or not? And then we compare that to, well, were they possibly captured in the same way? And if so, were they so embedded inside of the uh, Soviet system that they could, in fact, get control of a nuclear submarine or any nuclear device and do something that wasn't actually approved, authorized, discussed, agreed upon within uh, the Flutterboro, within the military machine. Um, and if that's true, if it was a rogue element, who was pulling the strings there? Do they still exist today? Were they taken out of power? Do they have power in other places? China, maybe they're embedded there now, or are they embedded here, or England or India, some other place. Do they have access still to people in those places. There doesn't have to be one group. It could be any of a number of groups. And so I come back to the Dias situation. Um, if proper procedures are not followed, if somebody is trying to use their position of authority as authorization to do something that is not... Um, officially sanctioned. And if you have, uh, one thing about um, procedures is you start in small ways to get people to look the other way on procedures. I'm thinking back to uh, the Clinton uh, White House when they weren't doing vetting of people in their positions in office immediately. And so you had people working their job six months a year, a year and a half, and they never even had their uh, security clearance. Uh, vetted. They've never gone through the procedure. Marvelous. And they're handling all sorts of stuff. And and this was complained about at the time. Well, part of it is that uh, in the midst of that, you can get a few people in and nobody's looking the other way and they didn't follow procedure. Well, they didn't know that yet, but they hadn't been cleared yet, but we'll get it sorted out later. Um, was there some kind of nefarious activity going on here where there was a belief on somebody's part that uh, they could intimidate, coerce uh, lower-level people to do something that was not um, proper because either they hadn't been trained properly or they were intimidated to where they would let it go because of who the person was that was telling them to do it. Well, they, they, it's got to be authorized because... He wouldn't tell me to do it if, if I wasn't supposed to do it. He's a known and trusted person. I'm not going to argue with him. I don't lose my job. And what happened at Dias, if I understand it correctly, uh, as you and I discussed, uh, you know, I, I'll venture a guess somewhere in there. There's some grandmother's boy, some mother's boy, who probably a farm kid from Nebraska or Iowa or Montana or Alaska or someplace who 
wasn't about to be intimidated, knew what his proper instructions were, and was trying to follow instructions, follow his his orders within his job description, and thought maybe he was even being tested for that matter, and wouldn't uh, waive procedure and complained when he saw that something wasn't going right. Because we got a lot of great guys in, in the services. Some guy that probably will get hounded out of the military now, uh, get 50 bad reports, something else, but he might have just saved us from some mischievous incident. Just like it's very possible that somebody in, in the Soviet Union, had they been able to... Um, get the right person's attention could have stopped the K-129 from ever leaving port. But, wow. you know, here, the, the, the question is, if you're moving around uh, devices that uh, really don't fit anywhere in the inventory currently and would have to have uh, modifications, updating, uh, servicing done, for what purpose? What, what was the point here? Well, and yeah, and yeah. to me, Congress should have, uh, the oversight committees should have been calling members and convening immediately to find out what the hell just happened. And even right now should be convening what is going on. Those people should be put in interview rooms, separated, and interviewed from the top to the bottom, and if somebody else's name, they need to be uh, uh, put somewhere and interviewed till we find out exactly with precision what happened, who asked for what, who authorized what, who did what, uh, and get to the bottom of the story. Because there's been several stories related to it. Now, if it turns out it was some kind of a test to make sure that people do their jobs right, I can understand that. But, you know, again, we've had a lot of these tests. And then suddenly in the midst of the test, some other incident happens. And I go right back, you know, to the, the mother of all tests, 9-11. And what are they doing on 9-11? They're testing uh, uh, NORAD, doing a test to see if uh, they can detect aircraft coming in that might be being uh, turned into bombs. How From the very day that. that that's exactly what happened? Come on. You know, <laughs> really. You know, the, the subway bombing in, in, in uh, London, and it's just right in the middle of a test day. You know, uh, it provides um, cover for, you know, nefarious activities. And, and, and again, you know, I go back to, you know, is this a captured operation? Um when things don't add up, you got to step back and, and, and ask, you know, why don't they add up? Why? And if you don't get a right answer, you don't just, okay, well, I don't know, let's move on. I mean, you and I have discussed many times, you get the government you work for, earn, and deserve. And if you won't rein your government in, keep them under control, make them toe the line, they're going to act rogue. It's the nature of governments. They're, you know, they're, they can be beasts. Yeah. So you do have to, um, uh, as a, as a uh, citizenry, remember that, you know, in our society, in our country, we left places where they had kings and created a government of the people by the people, for the people. Not government of the government, by the government, for the government, for the king, <laughs> for his appointed minions. That's and true. when they start operating that way, then you need to stop your feet and say no and hell no. Or you're going to get what you're going to get. If somebody is trying to test the system, Okay, I would like to see where that test was authorized, who asked for that test, what the purpose of the test was, and then why are you doing it with live munitions, with, with or I shouldn't say live, but with, with munitions that are the real thing. 
Um, was that actually necessary? Was it wise? I don't know the answer to that. That's a, that's a committee's question, you know, but they, they need to be asking those questions. Yeah, I, I would think, think so. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the – do you know the disposition? I mean, as far as I know, based on the information that we have from this whistleblower, this who, who by the way, is fearful of his life, um, these these mothballed warheads, to, to my knowledge, are on the loose. Well, okay, let's let's think of it slightly different. Imagine you're Putin right now. Putin's been read in on what happened in the 60s. He knows what happened with K-129. He knows it can happen. For all we know, some element to put him in power, put him in power as a result of whatever mischief they did to get, you know, through that incident. So he knows it's possible. And we have had all sorts of press reports here in the West concerning um, this ongoing question. Did Russia lose a bunch of suitcase nukes during and after the collapse? You know, the number that's bandied around is 100 suitcase nukes. I, I don't know that, you know, that's, that's a real number. Um, and some of it's, you know, probably to mess with our minds over here. But one suitcase nuke that's loose could sure ruin your day and even if it doesn't work right because it hasn't been maintained and serviced properly and they need a lot of maintenance and service. They're not really a little suitcase nuke. They're pretty large. They're just compact. Uh, you know, one of those, even just the material spread the right way could sure, you know, cause you a bad hair day. Um, <laughs> and if they were built in the first place, they can be serviced and if you've got access to the right stuff, you can update them and then bring them back online. So, you know, certainly I wouldn't put anything out of the capability of anybody. We don't know what we don't know. But if they know that they could have had that problem, and then they hear that something's being moved around over here, it's maybe loose, and they know or believe, because Putin's been saying it for, you know, almost two years now, that uh, he was being set up for a false flag against uh, Assad and ultimately Russia, uh, they're in Syria. They've been watching the chemical weapons. They've been saying, you know, they're going to do a false flag. They're going to do a false flag. We're on, we're on it. Don't let a false flag happen. They're going to try and blame it on us. They're going to try and use chemical weapons and blame it on us. They have good intel. They've been, they've been calling it all this time, and now we have those kinds of incidents happening that appear to be pretty validly reported. I don't care what anybody says. I'm not buying it. I think they are, uh, you know... Assad had no reason to use chemical weapons here in the last couple of weeks. It would serve no purpose. He wouldn't. And, exactly. And, and it, it, it's stupid. No, no, you're, you're right. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, just for the purpose of context, uh, our guest is, uh, is an insider's insider, a very special, a good friend of mine, a man I know. Look, I, I know this man's uh, street creds. And I'll tell you, if I were, if I were to tell you, you wouldn't believe me anyway. But, 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 but the bottom line is this. Ever since Benghazi happened, uh, this, uh, this source has been right with, uh, correct, that is, with every piece of information offered and served as the basis for the 31, 32 plus, uh, reports filed, uh, at the uh, CanadaFreePress.com, HomelandSecurityUS.com, and of course on the Hagman Hagman Report. This is the, the source of this information. So, it, it, days after Benghazi, he was saying, he was saying, hey, uh, watch for the false flag against Assad in Syria, even before anyone had brought that subject up. So, so I just wanted, just by context. So, go ahead and continue. Well, and I mean, I, the, the Russians had been saying that there was going to be that. Of course, you know, as, as we discussed, you know, Benghazi was really um, an opportunity to out the uh, uh, gun running and uh, 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 militia personnel transfer uh, from North Africa and from Libya to Syria, and so. 
Uh, most Americans had no clue, and even what little reporting was occurring was being, you know, uh, downplayed or suppressed or not getting attention. People weren't paying attention until Benghazi happened. And even now, most people, you're starting to get in the conversation pretty well, and I think this is where this latest pushback is coming from. People are, are getting it. Uh, uh, Syria did not just happen. It wasn't a civil war in the sense that, you know, it's being portrayed. You know, there are foreign fighters coming in and, and trying to cause uh, mischief and chaos. You know, I saw a report the other day uh, talking about that there's a thousand different groups in Syria with about 100 members each that are uh, engaging Assad. And about half of them are good bad guys and half of them are bad bad guys. And so we're trying to help the good bad guys. And so I'm sitting there listening to that, and I'm going, well, I got 20, 25 million people in Syria, you know, depending on whether you're going pre-war, post-war stuff, because uh, we have 5 million refugees out of there now, so there's not 25 million in there now. Um, and by the way, every American listening here has some responsibility, shared responsibility, because it's your government that went over there and picked the fight and created 5 million refugees, probably 150,000 uh, dead. The official figure is 110. You know, it's probably much higher than that, but, you know, there's a lot that they didn't necessarily get counted. And so whatever, you know, uh, the blood's on our hands. We, we share some responsibility. Is it a intelligent fight? Well... I mean, you know, let's have the conversation. This makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, and who does it serve? You know, I, I, I remember one of the articles you did, you know, with uh, the president giving the bow to uh, uh, the Saudi king. Okay. So who is he showing his uh, rear side to? Isn't that what's going on here? You know, you're, we're seeing the rear side of our president. He's given us a, a B.A., <laughs> I mean, while well, we're supposed to go in there and fight their war, and then they tell us they're going to, you know, uh, Kerry tells us that uh, uh, the, our Arab friends are willing to pay for this uh, adventure. Okay, so they're going to pay for it because we're paying for oil from them. Okay, and what's oil going to go to in the midst of this adventure? Oh, it'll probably double in price. Okay, so who's going to pay for it? <laughs> You're paying for it either way. They can say it came from the Arabs after, you know, it milked off a good portion of it. You're going to pay for it either way. That's just that's silly talk. You're, you're being lied to every way you can get lied. And so I go back to, though, uh, do you think the Russians are aware of the fact that it happened there? It could happen here. A rogue element, not following proper procedures, could be just a handful of men with some ulterior objective. They could be, you know, because they're going to get this right and set things right. They could be, you know, no doubt that'll be what it's, you know, alleged to be. They could be working for some further cause, uh, an international cause, you know, a globalist cause, whatever. You know, they could feel that they're absolutely right to do what they're going to do. You know, there's, there's, you know, if you go back to Pearl Harbor. The um, somewhat more widely accepted version of Pearl Harbor today, as opposed to, you know, 70 years ago, is that uh, we, in fact, had pretty doggone good intel that the Japanese were coming that way and we're going to do something there in Pearl Harbor. And we moved some of our uh, uh, more important vessels out to sea, out of dangerous way and then left the rest there like a sitting duck. Well, if that's true, what was the logic that was applied at the time? People in power, it's alleged, did it because we wouldn't have got into the war without some kind of an event that would get our blood boiling and get us in for real 100%. Well, it's easy to say now that uh, that was horrible if that's what occurred and shouldn't have happened. But maybe those guys were right. I'm just saying that. In fact, one of the people that uh, was one of my early um, mentors, his attitude was, no, 
It was a sacrifice those men fought and sacrificed in a war. Every bit as much as guys a year or two into it did. What happened was, by getting us into the war early, we kept it from starting in San Francisco. So that letting the Japanese war machine develop to a point where their bombers could come over and bomb us on our mainland. So there may have been a logic that was applied that it doesn't mean that those people that let it happen were totally nefarious. And I wouldn't try to pass judgment on them with limited knowledge. I, I, I get that. I mean, I'm, you know, it's, it's a hard pill to swallow. But here we are today. And, you know, we grew up with Gulf of Tonkin. We're living in the shadow of 9-11. If you believe the the stories that were being told about what 9-11 was about and how it happened and everything else, then you want to believe a lie. Well, how and, can you say that? We're, then we're conspiracy nuts, kooks and uh, uh, fruitcakes. Well, then maybe we need to be. At this point in time, see, I mean, you know, look at, what, look at Rush 15 years ago. If you believe this, you're not. He has his kook list, okay? And, uh, you know, here the other day, he at least postulated the possibility that somebody was uh, trying to false flag us. Well, Rush may have only come, you know, one footstep to our side, and he's got a mile to go. But, you know, he's nudging our way. In fact, you know, I say, somebody go out in the hall. I know the hall's full here in your in your show. And every seat's taken and you're lying in the wall. Somebody go grab a chair out of the next room, bring it in, and let Rush sit in the room with us. He's welcome. <laughs> Any of these folks that want to decide to join us at this point in time? Because I'll tell you what, you know, a senator that wasn't even hadn't even done a full term. We don't even know anything about, and, you know, suddenly he becomes a uh, president. Come on, man. Hey, something, isn't, something doesn't ring true here. Something's wrong. But, you know, whatever, okay. You know, you get the government you work for, earn and deserve. If people, if that's what people voted, if it was a real vote, well, then we need to keep them in check. And, and again, uh, he's the president we've got now. You know, the one thing I would say is is we need to, you know, be praying for those people that are in our leadership. I pray for the president. I pray for him every day that he would make sound decisions, that God would be there by his messengers, that his people would be in positions to make his will known. And that, you know... At least, if if uh, you know nothing else, keep him in check, and the people around him. Because you know the president doesn't do it; he does totally in a vacuum. He's part of a much bigger machine. He doesn't do it all by himself. He's got all sorts of people around him influencing. He's probably the most. Uh, he has fewer private moments than any other person almost on the planet. Honestly, so. Uh, you know, he's very under a lot, under a lot of people's thumb and, 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 and direction. And, um, you know, there's a lot of influence goes on there. I, I think, you know, look at the serious situation. The pushback that has occurred within the public, you couldn't get 90 plus percent of the people. I heard the other day on phone calls to Congress, uh, a number 520 or something to four. Uh, against going to Syria for yeah. people wanting to go. Yep. And, of course, you and I had the conversation, and, and they were, <laughs> at the time the conversation was 91% of the people uh, don't want to go into Syria. And I said, it's probably more like 99.1%. So we got the decimal point off. Well, then we can look at that congressional the phone call. That was what it was. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's 99.1%. You know, people, there's a, there's a collective sense within the broader public that, that, that something terrible lies ahead 
if we go headlong into this. Their collective consciousness is, is picking something up. So, you know, you can talk about voodoo and everything else. Sixth sense, it may just be all the information we received, you know, in our lifetime, you know, from a, a certain perspective, the Christian perspective, whatever, it just makes this nervous thing going on there. But, but Syria is not Iraq. It's not Libya. It's not Afghanistan. It does explode. It shatters. It blows out. And, and, uh, we should not tritely um, deal with any issue there uh, or take action there um, in a namby pamby kind of a way. This is a, this is life and death serious stuff. It could change our our, our lifestyle as we know it. It, it, it. Well, in the waning moment. Well, again, I come back. I come back to this whole conversation where we started here, and th- the point is that. Some mischief was going on, it sounds like. And I asked, well, if we decided it was okay there, okay, we had other, you know, just a few weeks ago. We had a base commander relieved of duty, Air Force base commander, because of his uh, uh, methods uh, not being sound in monitoring and maintaining the security of uh, nuclear weapons at a base uh, in the northern uh, U.S. Uh, here just a couple of years ago, we had uh, a, a bomber fly across the country with nuclear weapons with improper authorizations on the bomber. And uh, then there's been um, questions about whether or not those weapons were properly accounted for and returned. Uh, we've never gotten in the public purview straight answers and even within the oversight committees uh, you know they can say anything they want there's members that say that uh, they didn't get um, satisfaction on that oversight so so part of the question goes back to is there stuff going on that you know we're being told to just sit down and shut up uh, we'll be in the ground shortly <laughs> Yeah, uh, not on the ground. You know, the yeah. You know, and, and one of the incidents that comes to mind, you know, for anybody that thinks that that's, that's just not true and I'm overstating it, Barry Goldwater confronted the head of the Air Force at the time and asked him about is there, you know, aliens in Area 51, what's going on there? And uh, he was also asking about Rick Patterson, but uh, when he talks to you privately, you'll say that. But he has actually said, and probably can go on YouTube it if you want to. And he says that he was told to never ask that question again. Don't talk to me about that. I'm not giving him. He's a U.S. senator. He sits in all the right committees. He asked a direct question that he had a right to know as our elected representative. And he got told to mind his own business. And he never followed it further. Why? Because apparently even with being on the right committees, with everything else, he wasn't authorized to know. So when you say that, uh, um, you know, there will be people in a congressional committee that are going to know what happened and dug it to the bottom of it, well, maybe they won't. You know, I go back to the Glomar Law. Most people have no clue of this. When they talk about, you know, is there space aliens and, and what's at Area 51 and these other bases, you know, there's other places that are more important than Area 51 at this point. So when, when they try to find out information, they are stopped, headed off, um, with Glomar Law. And that was because after the Glomar Explorer, a number of news agencies went out and tried to get um, information about what occurred uh, in this recovery operation, what was picked up, um, plus some other operations that happened that uh, were beyond the submarine recovery. And when they try to find out, you know, about, you know, the moon landing, the aliens, whatever they want to talk about, what laws pulled out of the woodwork? Blumar law that cuts off all inquiry, all need for any agency of government to release any information 
because wow. it is the most secure, or it was supposed to be the most secure uh, piece of information out there. Because why? Because because had it happened, our world would be completely different than it is today, and the information. Information is knowledge, is power. The information that the attempt was made to make it happen did change the world around you. China opened up. Uh, we went whole hog after Russia during the Reagan administration and engaged them. And the wall eventually came down. And uh, all of that knowledge... All of that um, history with China opening up and Nixon's efforts in there and the, and the um, Asian uh, tigers coming out uh, uh, and prospering and growing, that changed our country in ways that you can't even quantify. We could talk for days about all the minutiae of ways that our country is different because of China opening up and counterbalancing Russia. Had we, had somebody succeeded in having us uh, uh, take out China, we might be speaking Russian today. Huh. So, or we might very seriously be in a very different world. We'd be in, in maybe even more of a Cold War world than we are today. We might have already fought World War Five. Mm. You know, constant war for constant peace. And at some level, maybe we've been doing that all along anyway. In some ways, it's just a continuation of World War II even now. So, again, we come back to, uh, you know, I, when I've talked in certain situations, uh, trying to bring guys up to speed so they understand why we're, where we're at um, in some areas, um, uh, I'll say you're on the water. And you look out over the water, you see that boat over there, you see that building built on pilings over the water, and uh, you can see a seal pop up every once in a while, and maybe even a whale out there, something like that, seagulls flying through the air. You see all this stuff out there, and yet just a few inches, a few feet below the surface of the water, you can't see anything. It's dark. It's mysterious. And you're looking at it from the top of the boat, from, from the shoreline, from whatever, uh, you you have a particular perspective, but if you could put the swim goggles on or, or put a submarine out there and go down, you'd see it's just teeming with all sorts of life and activity. And the further down you go, the more mysterious and weird and different it gets and bizarre. You know, we see these pictures of, of the sea life at very deep depths around ocean vents that you know, very high temperatures and worms that are living there that we didn't think could live at those temperatures and, and bacteria and, and the weirdest looking fish in the dark in these, in these deep subsea locations. Um, that's kind of the world around us. You get into the intelligence community. You get into the behind the scenes politics, things like WikiLeaks have, have went out and the NSA stuff like that. There's a whole world. And it's really not very far away from us when you're on a ship on the surface of the ocean. You know, you can look 10, 15 miles out across the ocean, across the surface of the ocean, the curve of the, of the Earth. And yet, only a few hundred feet below you is all this other activity going completely unseen. You have no clue. You have no idea what's going on. And that's the world we live in. Just right around us, just under us, is this whole underworld, undercurrent of machinations in the business world, in the political world, in the military world, in the intelligence world, in the secret society world. And it's going on all around you. And it's very, you know, if you realize it and you start to look at it, you realize, you know, Right here on the surface, it may look all calm, but <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff going on just under the surface that uh, some of it could be very dangerous to us. And at this exact moment, 
I think it, it we're getting indicators that we cannot ignore. You know, if you look at for hot burner, we have pain receptors that tell us, oh, how hot, you know, don't do that again. Pay attention. Watch what's going on. It's to warn you off of danger. Okay. Uh, somebody sensed danger and put their life, their career, their family, everything they have at risk to let you know something's wrong. Now, you can leave them twisting in the wind, and they'll be gone and vaporized, and you know, you all know the truth of it. They'll be under the surface and gone out of sight, and the whale will have eaten them, the shark will have eaten them, whatever, they're gone. Or you can scream bloody murder to find out what is going on. And how does that trade relate to what's been going on at some of these bases in the north, what's been going on over the last decade or two, and are these people who are there working for us actually working for us or working against us or managing us according to what they believe is in somebody's best interest, not necessarily ours. For all the very you know, the, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Not everybody that's doing these things, just like I was going back to, to Pearl Harbor, there may very well have been very good reasons to do what they did to stir the public. And, and maybe they were right. Maybe they saved a million deaths on the mainland by getting us to engage when they did where we did because we were just, you know, Babes in the woods, and we couldn't see the real danger, and they were smart enough to see the real danger. But at some point, you have to grow up, and 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 I, I don't know if I want people making those decisions for us as a people, and especially when you have ninety plus percent of the people saying no. You know, uh, those buildings at every state house, every capital in the country, you see domes on all these buildings, yeah. and that dome is like a megaphone, both for, for receiving and transmitting sound. And the symbology, as I understand it, is that when the people speak, their voices are concentrated under that megaphone dome, and their elected representatives hear the voice of the people, the collective voice, and take action, do what um, the people are, um, you know, willing them to do on their behalf. But when you have 90 plus to 99% of the people agreeing on something, which you can't get get them to agree on a sunny day (laughs) uh, in in this country at this point in time, I don't know, you know, I I don't know of any other subject that you could say that we're in agreement on. Well, one time we all agree and then our elected representatives say they're not going to listen. Or at least that's what's you know, thus far been the conversation. Hopefully, maybe they'll agree here in a few days. You know, you got to wonder. You know, the, the other thing that comes to me, and I, I apologize, I'm just rattling on, but I'm trying to give some picture that people can reference in their mind so they can kind of put this in perspective. Um, when I was very young, I was a paper boy, and the movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey, came out, and I had a lady on my paper out whose son was the manager of one of these Cinerama theaters. And so uh, she's very elderly. Her son would give her tickets. She'd never go to a movie because she was in her 90s. So she'd give me these movie tickets. So I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey like 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I know the movie pretty well. And uh, over time, I came to understand the story, what I believe Arthur C. Clarke was really trying to tell us in this incredible story. And that was, if you watch the movie, you see at the very outset, there is a discovery on the moon of some ancient material, some ancient civilization, remnant leftovers there, some piece that is 
still somehow active transmitting some some of the power on this obelisk. And so upon discovering this, it was, of course, made top, top, top secret. And the military-industrial-political complex, in hand-in-hand with the media complex, does not release the information. They have several ruses, and the moon bases are having a disease, so, you know, flu or something, and so nobody's getting to leave the base so they can spread the story. It's, it's all shut off. And so under the guise of protecting us, they proceed with this mission to go out to uh, uh, Jupiter and to, um, you know, discover something that's out there that's communicating with this obelisk at the moon. And this mission, there's a computer on the spacecraft, the HAL 9000. And so the 9000 has never made an error, ever in its existence. All the times it's been used, it's been perfect in all of its calculations. And it tells them that something on the spaceship is going to fail and they need to go repair it before it fails because it's detecting a problem with this piece of equipment. So go grab it, bring it back in, and test it to see if it's going to fail, and it doesn't fail. And it doesn't. You know, it checks out just fine. So now they can't figure out if the computer's screwed up or what because the computer's never made a mistake. And eventually, because the computer starts acting weird, uh, you know, they start talking about shutting off the computer because if, if it's going to make a mistake, it could endanger the mission. Well, then the computer decides that it's going to shut them off before they can stop it because its mission is more important than they are because it's been programmed to believe that it's the most important thing. And so this race happens, and they end up shutting off the computer. Well, in 2010, the Space Odyssey, the answer is given. We're left in suspense after 2001 on a lot of details. So they go back out, and what do we find out when the scientist reactivates the computer and has the conversation and finds out what's going on? The computer, this machine, and remember... Our government is a machine at some level. Our constitution is very mechanical in the way that it functions. The machine in that spaceship, that computer in the spaceship, the HAL 9000, was programmed to tell a lie. It was programmed to conceal the truth from the astronauts. It was programmed that its mission superseded that of the astronauts. And so it could kill all the astronauts on the vessel if necessary in order for it to complete its mission. And who was its mission for? The military, industrial, political complex. Wow. And... If you look at what our situation is here, we're in the spaceship, and the complex thinks its mission is more important than us. Its purposes, its goals, it's more important than us. And so it's been programmed that we're expendable. It's been programmed in a way that it can't compute. It's told that you have to preserve life, but you have to destroy life if it threatens you. Well, that's a catch-22. And the computer started giving errors. Why? Because it couldn't reconcile the lie with the truth. It could not compute a lie. Our system here in this country is failing right now because it's being told to lie. But the core program was never designed to operate to protect lies. Our Constitution, which I consider like a holy document, to protect the rights of the individual, to protect the rights of the citizenry, no function of government done at any higher level than that which is necessary in order to accomplish its ends. A decentralized power base not a centralized power base. 
not a highly centralized power base, so that nobody could corrupt it easily. Nobody could take it over easily because it was so diffused. You'd have to buy off 50,000 people, 50,000 municipalities or cities or counties or whatever, not 50 senators or probably a portion of that, actually, to get right down to it. You know, look at the situation on the, on the Syria thing. You've got the two largest lobbying groups in Washington telling us to go into Syria and lobbying every senator, every Pentagon person, every business person. We've got to go. We've got to go now. We've got to go right away. Well, who are those two lar- largest lobbying groups? The Saudi and the Israeli lobbying groups. What an alliance that is. Who'd ever thought? And when you see two groups like that working together, you got to say, well, who's coordinating them? Got to be pretty big. And if they're able to jerk our chain and, and get us in there, they got to be really big, don't they? That's like extra governmental. That's something beyond any individual government at some higher level. That's peeking be behind that's, the curtain. Of, of, I mean, that's, that's pretty big. Well, yeah, indeed it is. See, and, and the other thing that, 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 you know, just if anybody thinks just, the lies just go on and on and on, we're immersed in lies. We're drowning in lies right now. I, you know, one of the one of the other examples I was thinking about the computer just a second. You know, remember back the IRS got a couple of different uh, computer systems built for it. It cost a billions, and the first one didn't work. And so they reinvented it, built a newer one. That one didn't work. What was the reason they didn't work? Because when they tried to put the code into the computer, all the laws, all the uh, uh, various uh, rulings, etc., it didn't compute. You couldn't <laughs> reconcile the code with the applications, the laws, the findings. Why? Because it was they were cross purposes. Why? Because it was totally political. If you're a corporation founded on such and so day in such and so county before the hour of noon, then <laughs> you get this write off on this particular thing, but anybody else doesn't get it. Well, who got that? A lobbyist got some senator to include that in a bill, but then uh, they get a break. And you, the average person, you can't even ever figure out who that corporation is practically. But they get a write off and you don't. You know? Uh, you can't reconcile with the, the, the laws themselves. They don't, you know, they don't compute. Go to any area of our society right now and look at these rulings coming down the pike, and you got to ask yourself, does that compute? So many of them don't. They, they're at cross purposes. They don't make sense. Well, who is that serving? And, 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 and what's the point there? It's not serving the public, and it's not, it's not, you know. It's not clear, it's vague, you know, it should be void for vagueness. And so, you know, I come back in that cloud of confusion, in that fog of lies. And like with Syria, all the, the teary eyes about, we've got to go in there and save the children. What? <laughs> you, you, you saw this latest thing right now. The Alawites, I believe it is, are saying that the children supposedly that died in this gas attack on the 21st weren't even rebel kids. They were kidnapped kids from this Alawite community that were put there to be gassed. They, they were kidnapped kids. We're not saving anybody if these lies, if we allow these lies, if we act on these lies. Any more than we would have if we'd acted on the lie of K-129. We'd have killed millions. We'd have had millions of our own killed. We'd have been in a in a war to beat all wars, and somebody else would have stepped into the vacuum and, and been laughing the whole way. And that's where we are this right now. This is a now. very dangerous thing, and that's where we are right now. This is a very dangerous thing. We can't really, We can't be blown off on this. We can't accept that we'd be blown off on this. We need to be heard. And I believe we've bought time. Benghazi forward. Benghazi, remember, they wanted to be doing what they are trying to do right now in Syria almost a year ago. That's right. Had Benghazi happened, see, and, and we were just 
pulling out of Benghazi. We'd already got all the stuff out of there uh, for the most part. We were shutting down operations there. We were on to the next step. We were, you know, they had this mortar attack into uh, Turkey, into a refugee camp that allegedly happened. And later on, it comes out that actually the uh, mortar attack came from a uh, FSA position, a uh, Free Army position, the, the rebels. And it was a false flag thing. A mom and a child died. And they were trying to get us to put in an air cap to protect the refugee camps and everything else. If we'd have acted on that air cap thing then, we'd have acted on a lie. A total lie. And we'd have already, instead of having 150,000 dead and 5 million refugees, there might be millions already dead. We'd be a year down the road. So public, the public has risen to the cause and has, I think, kept this in check. The question is, if there's some other game plan here, remember the public kept us out of World War II for quite some time, kept us out of World War I for quite some time. That's why the nefarious activities, if that's what occurred, had to occur because we had to be prodded, uh, cattle prodded into the war. So... They figure they got a cattle product in. I think that's what's going on here. I, I, I think that we have to, you know, you remember the movie uh, we talked about it some time back where uh, uh, they live amongst us or whatever, the, the aliens, and you get the special sunglasses and you, you can see the, you're surrounded by aliens. They're taking over everything and uh, zombies and everything else. And if you put the glasses on, you can see exactly what there, what's there. And you talk about, you know, uh, seeing the news in 3D, Hagman and Hagman. You know, we need to put on our truth detector glasses and look past the foggy, misty, teary eyes and, and foggy lies and see what's actually going on. I wouldn't go to a political event without having them on to look past all this, you know, bullshit that we're being uh, the stink of it, the steamy, stinky poop piles that we're being flinking thrown into here to see it for what it is. Something is truly wrong here. And unless people in mass say no and hell no, you know, yeah, am I using a couple harsh words there that aren't, you know, that comfortable? Somebody's going to be using a lot worse words than that. If their son, their brother, their daughter, somebody else dies, whether it's on foreign soil or here in a shopping center. This okay. is going to get nasty. And if people are willing to lie to us to cause us to go to war over a chemical thing and, and, and other stuff... What are they capable? What's what? What would they stop at? If nine eleven wasn't what it said to have been, what would they stop at? And you know, we either hang together or we hang separately. I, I, I think you know, uh, you know, we've been put in this position by people that are very artful magicians who have very carefully constructed a maze for us that with their machinations and mirrors and fogs and sounds, we're being driven to where they want to stand up. We're being driven down the cattle chute. We're being processed. If you won't act for yourself, at least act for your own kids. And there you have it. Designs on, you know, if they got designs on those people's kids over there, they haven't got designs on yours. They don't care about those kids over there. They probably don't care about yours either. Because their plan is more important. The machine, the machine has been programmed, and all the members and parts of the machine believe that they exist for a particular purpose that is known only by the machine, and the machine can't be wrong, and the machine has to be protected. Wow. You know, you got to wake up before it's too late. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very blessed, very fortunate, very lucky 
Folks, I, I think you just heard about 90 minutes of the most important audio you'll ever hear. Uh, and I, I'm sorry to cut you off at this point. We're out of time, but I do hope you will come back uh, and, and provide more of your insight, your experience, and your and your. Well, I, I can't say I can't say it's easy to listen to. It's very disconcerting, but it's the truth, and uh, people can handle the truth, and, and we need to act upon the truth and identify the truth. Well, and and God, bless, God bless those people that are getting to the truth of SEAL Team 6, because it's in the same venue. These people are trying to conceal a lie related to bin Laden and that whole event, and those people that had a part uh, were in their sights to protect their lie. Uh, and God bless those people, too, and their efforts give them great success in unveiling the truth of what's going on. Thanks, Doug. Amen. God bless. Thank you, sir. Folks, that was a very special guest, a, a person that I've known for a number of years, and I've got to tell you, he's been right spot on with all information he's given to me, uh, more insight uh, hopefully coming our way by this uh, tremendous gentleman. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Uh, Joe Hagman, Doug Hagman, together we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. We'll be right back.